water walkers, if you will. I like that, the water walkers, the water justice walkers, uh, before they began their trip. And then we checked in with um, Kim Redigan during the week last week and talked about uh, how that was going, the people that they were meeting, the conversations that we were having. Um, I found it fascinating that she equated uh, the need, the right for water uh, and what is happening to people to genocide. I thought that that was a, a really um, profound uh, a statement, sadly enough. Well, the walk is over. They finished on Friday. They headed to Lansing for the rally on the Capitol steps. And I thought it would be nice if we just kind of wrapped up what happened uh, over the last couple of days of the walk. And so we are going to do that right now. Um, I was supposed to have two guests, so I only have one on the line right now. So I'm not sure who I have. So if you'd be so kind as to tell me who you are so I can identify you properly, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, this is Nadia Gaber. Um, I'm Our... participants on the walk. Yes. Well, uh, congratulations, by the way, on um, what I think was a fairly sensational uh, idea uh, that came to fruition. I, I think, Nadia, that at the end of the day, the media coverage was good. Uh, the people that showed up were enlightened and educated. And ultimately, we will see if affordability ends up becoming a topic uh, that our politicians will embrace. And I am guessing that we now have Mandy Ryan as well. Mandy, is that you? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, so as we, you know, as we kind of take a look, Nadia, at the uh, the end of the week, uh, tell me how things went uh, leading to Flint, and then we'll talk about uh, the, the road trip from Flint to Lansing. So how did things go the last couple of days leading to Flint? Um, well, it went really well, actually. We had kind of our core group of walkers, um, me, Mandy, Kim, Jeremy, a few other people um, who were kind of hitting our stride. We kind of got a sense of each other's pace and learned how to talk to people along the way. Um, and, yeah, I met up with a lot of people in Holly um, and then, yeah, people out in Flint, all of whom were kind of you know, across the board mm -hmm. concerned about their water rates and their bills. Um, and then certainly in Flint, the concerns are just amplified because people don't feel safe drinking or using their water. In fact, it was funny when we got to Flint, um, we kind of ended the walk and sat at a restaurant to get some food. And as we were walking in the door, there was a sign on the door that said, beware, we do use Flint water. And there was oh. a notice on the door about that had been you know delivered by the city about um, the safety or the fears around the safety about the water so that was the first thing we saw when we sat down in Flint and we thought wow well, it was really appropriate that we walked all the way here you know it, it's fascinating i was at an event on saturday uh the, the progressive blog eclectic blog had a fundraiser and i was talking to uh, one of the people that was there, and they said that uh, in one area, and he didn't know exactly where it was, uh, but the, he said that they had tested the water and found that the lead levels in the water was twice, twice as toxic as acceptable. And that scared the hell out of me. I mean, absolutely scared the hell out of me. Now, Neil, let me ask you one more question, then we'll talk to Mandy for a, mo for a moment. How did you get involved uh, in, in this movement, and why did you decide to, to walk, to bring um, light to this uh, critical issue? Um, well, I was at the International Gathering of Social Movements um, Conference on Water and Housing Affordability in late May, and that's actually where this idea was conceived. Um, some activists from Flint came down and talked about what they were experiencing, and um, Kim sort of went up to their table and said, that's it, we're going to walk to you. We're going to do it 4th of July weekend. And so the whole thing was organized within a month, really, which in and of itself is kind of an amazing feat. And so I knew that that was happening. And um, I am oh, like a graduate student. I work in public health. And so I was interested in what was happening out here anyway and thought that I would be able to walk um, and so signed up to do it. Granted, it was much more challenging, I have to say, physically than I thought it would be um, 
And so uh, we all, like, really had to support each other along the way. But um, it was it was really quite an honor to be out with people who have been organizing around not just this issue, but who have really been leaders um, in the civil rights movement for a very long time. All right. Well, we now turn our attention to Mandy Ryan. Mandy, let me start with that question to you as well. Why did you get engaged in this to bring light to this critical issue of our need for water and uh, obviously uh, affordable water, but more importantly, um, you know, the, the, the idea that water is a right. Why did you get involved in this? Uh, last summer, I had, you know, as a part with the water shut off and uh, people setting up water stations and just seeing, like, the devastation that was happening within my community. And so when I heard they were going to walk to Flint, it was like, wow, this is an amazing opportunity to be able to talk with just everyday people on the streets and hear their stories. And it was very powerful to be able to to experience that. Would you uh, would you say that of the cities that you stopped in, I know the Detroit and Highland Park, Pontiac, um, Holly, and Holly seems to be a critical link here because this was a community that normally people don't go, well, you know, that's a community that would be affected by this. One of the things that I found out as we were covering this, Mandy, is people didn't realize that this wasn't a Detroit-only issue. Uh, and they thought it was a Detroit only issue. They have no idea. You know, a lot of people don't even know. You know, the the the, the balance of people in this uh, in southeast southeast Michigan and beyond get their water from the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, and so these rate hikes affect them. And they knew that their water rates were going up, but they didn't see the connection. Um, and so I find that fascinating. I would think that as you uh, met with folks, and as you saw people along the way that, you know, uh, Mandy, at some level, people were really enlightened and empowered by the information that you were sharing. People would stop us on the street and ask us, you know, about what we were doing and tell us their stories. And it wasn't just these cities. It was every city, pretty much. There was somebody that had something going on with their water rates, or even if they had um, wells. All of a sudden, they were now being charged for sewage that they hadn't before been charged. And so it wasn't just these, you know, the main cities. It was every city we went through. We heard a story from somebody. Yeah, well, it, it's astounding. So let's uh, let's go with the last couple of days. And um, uh, Nadia, Gaber, I'll go back to you. Uh, obviously, I would think that once you got to Flint, uh, because of all of the profound problems with the water there, the emergency manager. And I don't want to forget, uh, and I don't want this audience to forget, that some of the crisis in this water uh, crisis is because of emergency management. Uh, but in Flint, they've created a very rare and dangerous situation where they have gone off the water uh, from the city of Detroit. Um, they were not prepared to do that. Uh, people have been getting sick. Uh, I've even suggested that uh, people have died from drinking this tainted water. Um, the story about being in a restaurant and having signs up that says, you know, don't, basically, don't drink the water. It's not safe. Uh, people can't live on bottled water. They just can't. And it, it's, it's just, it's too expensive. And we shouldn't have to do that, which goes back to water being a right, you know, self, uh, you know, a safe, uh, clean, affordable water, affordable water being a right. Um, but with that said, I would have to think that once you got to Flint, uh, the attitude there was, I, I will, I'm betting, uh, certainly Nadia, much, the people there were much more aware and probably a whole lot angrier. Well, I mean, you brought up a couple of really important things there. I mean, so in Flint, you know, it was both the double cost of much more expensive um, cost for water once they switched um, off of the Detroit River system and onto the Flint water system. And then on top of that, having to, because they couldn't trust um, the water, not only were they paying expensive rates for water that they couldn't use, then having to pay a lot of money to buy bottled water. So we met a lot of people who had taken second jobs um, and who were working, you know, two partners, both with full-time, two two jobs, um, 
to pay for that just to make up for the difference in water bills. So, I mean, the strain that it's putting on families was pretty obvious on top of them being sick and not feeling well um, and not feeling up to working, you know, that hard all the time. So that was really um, difficult to hear and really compelling. And I hope that we're able to do some more research and just find out more about what's really going on because I think related to your point about emergency management, which was certainly a theme throughout the cities on the walk, um, whether they were currently under emergency management or had been previously, um, there's just some really, I think, some interesting questions about democracy that are being raised where what people in Flint were saying is, well, we want to have our water tested, but we, the, the city does um, have like a testing program for the water, but they won't um, the EPA and the CDC actually need the permission of the city of Flint in order to come in and do any tests, and they haven't been granted that yet. So there's a concern about accountability um, that the people are expressing that I think is really important. Well, this is uh, this is really astounding. So we leave Flint. I know there's a road trip to Lansing. So, uh, you know, let's talk, uh, uh, if we can, Mandy, a little bit about what happens when you guys get to the Capitol and have the rally there. Well, we had a, we started out on the steps and gathering and um, when the buses pulled up, we were welcomed by a, a group from Lansing, which was really nice to have seen, you know, that support that they were offering us. And then um, we went over to the governor's office to give him um, these cards that we had people signing along the way, you know, asking for clean, affordable water. And he said he was too busy to, to speak with us um, and that we had not filled out the correct paperwork to um, request a meeting with him. So there was a lot of getting a run around, and um, after a while, they were finally able to give us the paperwork, and so we are requesting still to be able to talk to the governor, to be able to hear what he has to say about this. Well, you know, the governor has really been very silent on this for a long time, and uh, I see what's happening in Flint, and I wonder if he's only the governor of wealthy white people or all people. Um, although maybe if you looked at the numbers, he kind of is, uh, the voting numbers, he kind of is the governor of wealthy white people, but we'll save that for another conversation. Um, I, I don't know that the governor has a conscience though, Nadia. I, I think about, uh, the way he's ignored, uh, the plight of the people in the city of Detroit. He considers himself the great savior of Detroit, um, which is again, true to some extent, if you are a wealthy business owner, if you're not. I'm not so sure this governor's on your side. And certainly we've seen the way he has ignored uh, the people of Flint. And in fact, he has not made a public statement about Flint ever. <clears throat> At some point here, don't we need to, Nadia, hold him accountable for this problem? Well, like Mandy mentioned, I mean, the, the culmination of the walk, the whole point of the bus trip to Lansing, I think, was to do just that. And it was really the point was to invite the governor um, to a meeting to be able to deliver these cards. And I think when people were there, they were talking about even more, let's have a town hall um, and have the governor come and listen to the concerns of the citizens from all of these different cities um, to be able to speak directly to him. Um, beyond that, I couldn't really say I'm new to Michigan myself. Um, so, so Mandy might be a better person to talk to about the governor um, himself, but I do think that there was some concerted emphasis in, in the design of this walk to bring many cities together to make sure that people know this is not just a Detroit issue or not just a Flint issue. This has connections, you know, all throughout basically everywhere that the regional water system connects to. Yeah, absolutely. Mandy, go ahead and comment on that as well. Um, I feel like it isn't even just the governor that's ignoring this. It was also like council people we are inviting to, you know, have the town hall meetings with us and we might get one that would show up. Um, and so it's, it's that the whole government is completely ignoring that this situation is happening and that people are getting sick and that people don't have water. Well, you know, my frustration with this particular issue is we often talk about uh, societal problems that are difficult to solve. This one is not that difficult to solve. Um, 
you know, there. I know that there are plans or you know, proposals out there that would, uh, you know, tie your water rates into a percentage of what you make, and that, of course, would be an easy solution, uh, or easier, no question about that. But really, when we talk about all of the problems that are multi-layered, and there are many. Listen, I, I'm not suggesting that legislating is easy at any level, but to either ignore or just give something lip service uh, when there is a crisis at hand, and I do believe that the right to water um, is in a crisis right now, and, and you can both respond to this, uh, but because this is a solvable problem and they continue to not solve it, you really must under, I mean, it's really hard to understand why they don't address this. Your thoughts? I think a lot of it, it's, it's money. It's who, you know, how much money can we save? But then if you look at it, it's like how much money is a life worth? It's like they're putting a price on somebody's life. And, you know, it's like, oh, we can save a little bit of money by not doing this. Well, yeah, there, there does seem to be a correlation to that, especially when, you know, our nerd governor uh, looks at everything from a balance sheet. Uh, of course, again, we're talking about, uh, you know, maybe we're just not in agreement that water is a right. And you, and you both mentioned this international conference. For those that aren't familiar with the reference, um, there were people from all over the world that came to Detroit back in May and talked about this very issue in great length and whether or not water was a, a right. Uh, and I can't fathom that uh, some people don't see it as a fundamental right. We will also see all the challenges we're having right now with the government insistence that the only way to fight ourselves through this horrid economy is to stop spending and start cutting. Well, that would be fine if there was any historical purpose that says, yeah, that works, but it doesn't. We don't have any historical reference that that underlines that. And so, you know, Nadia, I'll, I'll come back to you. When we, again, when we take a look at a problem that's solvable, when we know that there is indeed uh, a reason that people can't pay their bills, and again, as we said with Kim last week, no one has ever said they want their water to be free. No one's saying that. We're not saying, hey, I want free water. But anyone that's ever had kids, you know, what's that? Watch that, right? Kids are, what's that? Watch that. Well, that's your bottled water because we can't open up our tap and drink the water. That, that's just wrong. It's just wrong. I, I don't know. I just, I, I just really believe that this walk that happened last week is a, a significant step forward in bringing light to the issue. But as you both have stated, and, and Mandy, I'll come back to you, as you both have stated, we're not getting the kind of political discourse that we need. And Kim talked about State Rep. Julie Pilecki, Pilecki on Thursday when she was on the show and that she is committed to bringing, the, bringing this issue to the House floor, and, and that's great, and I hope it happens. Um, I also believe that not only do we need more politicians involved in this uh, fight, Mandy, but we need more citizens involved in the fight. And so how do you think we can engage both subsets to get more inflamed and want to see change on this issue as water, and especially, you know, literally living in the Great Lakes. I mean, we're right in the middle of this amazing water resource. There shouldn't be a person here that should ever go thirsty. Your thoughts, Mandy? Um, I think that, you know, people are just trying to survive. Talking about citizens is, you know, they're just trying to get enough money to be able to pay their rent, be able to pay their bills. So to take the time off to, you know, do something, it's hard for them. And I know a lot of people, like, support us in what we're doing, but they're like, oh, I just don't have the time. I'm just, you know, trying to feed my children right now. Um, and even though they, they're supportive of it, so it's finding ways to be able to connect people in to, to different things that they can do. 
And, you know, we've been saying we don't have the answers. Like, if you, if you have a suggestion, bring it to us. We'd love to hear it. We're very open to what everyone has to say because we have to figure this out as a community. Um, and hopefully maybe at some point the government will start to listen that the people, you know, will start to listen to the people and realize that this is a bigger issue than just a few activists saying something. Well, no, I, I think that that's, uh, that's well said. Um, I've been on this little bit of a, a kick lately where not that I, I, I certainly see the value in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, you know, all of the other uh, wonderful social media sites out there. But to me, that's not activism. <laughs> to me, activism is, is doing what you folks did, is getting up and taking to the streets and being heard. And you know, whether it's five people or 500 people, I think it's critically important that we stay focused on engagement and liking something or retweeting something isn't engagement. Um, that doesn't involve any brain work, in my opinion. Uh, okay, it can be challenging to respond to something in 140 characters, but if that's as challenging as it gets, well, then I guess we're doing okay. Um, Nadia, is there, are there any plans for the future for this group? Any other, uh, civil protest plans? Um, I think this is a huge culmination of a lot of work in addition to the international gathering. The group has been active for years now. Um, the People's Waterboard Coalition, the Highland Park Coalition for Human Rights, um, and the Flint Coalition for Clean Water. So each, each of those groups um, is very active. I mean, along the route, they were holding town halls, um, doing different demonstrations. Um, in Flint, people brought their the water that came out of their tap in order to kind of hold it up and see all the different colors that it comes out. Um, and so I think, like, in relation to what you just said about social media, one of the things that the walk taught me, I mean, just walking that far, it was a really different engagement with the different cities and with communities and just with people, you know, the ability to slow down and see things from a street level and talk to people, um, it kind of invites conversation in a different way. But I think that there are different roles for different people to play. And I think that um, what the movement is learning is that we really have to have more creative approaches, multi-pronged approaches, and kind of be doing it at every level um, in order to engage as many people as possible um, on different platforms, including, you know, that just tried and true face-to-face -face street level engagement. Well, I will have to say that I am pleased and I, not, I am often not pleased with the mainstream media, but I am pleased in this regard that they really did seem to do a fairly good job, especially at the beginning, uh, bringing attention uh, to the work that the People's Water Board uh, had decided to do, this uh, walk and this rally. Uh, that began in Detroit on July 3rd and went across the state and up to the Capitol on July 10th is just an affirmation to what people can do. And again, I was pleased that the, uh, that the mainstream media at least had enough interest in this topic um, to cover it. I, I didn't see all, I mean, I, I saw it all. I didn't watch it all. I didn't read it all uh, because I've obviously been reporting on it as well. Uh, but what I did see or read uh, was very positive, and I'm I'm guessing you're both very pleased with that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that um, you know, water is just such a fundamental and compelling issue that when people actually see and hear the stories of people having to go without water, whether because they can't afford to pay for it or because they don't trust the quality of it, I mean, that's something that kind of turns your head and wrenches your heart a little bit and makes you pay attention to what's really happening. And um, I think that people are often surprised to hear, like you said, especially right around the Great Lakes, that these are challenges that we're facing here in 2015. Absolutely. Well, listen, uh, Mandy Ryan and Nadia uh, Garver, I want to thank you both for being with us, our water justice walkers, uh, as we conclude uh, the walk and the rally, and hopefully it will make a difference. So again, my thanks to both of you, not for just being on this program, but for having the passion and the conviction to follow through 
on the things that you said that you were uh, proud to be involved with and glad that you picked this issue. So thank you both again for your time this morning. Now go soak 